So, after the doctor finds out that his death is a fixed point in time, he decides to have one last party. He visits his old friend, Craig, who subsequently saves him from Cybermen, and then goes on to support his little family by selling Weight Watcher subscriptions and coffee machines, then gets into a bit of trouble. Then he finds out from the talking head of the chubby blue guy, Dorian, that he's supposed to go to somewhere called Trenzalore and answer a question that must never be answered. Doctor Who? And so, uh, after a bit of wibbly-wobbly timey-wimey, he decides that he's gotten too big for his britches, so he makes the universe think he's dead. But he can't quite bring himself to just be a hermit. So, onward and upward. First, after saving the Earth quietly from an alien spaceship, he meets a lady named Madge, who, along with her husband, are worried about the brewing war in uh, Europe. They've already had a world war. Is it possible that there's going to be a second one? Yes, there is, because not long after, her husband is piloting a bomber somewhere over the channel, and it vanishes, presumed lost, leaving Madge a widow and her kids um, without a dad. So, as a bit of an apology, he sets himself up as caretaker of a relative's estate and tries to give the broken family a semi-Merry Christmas. He's decked out the house, Time Lord style, and while <clears throat> Madge is uh, a little perturbed, the kids seem to like it, even though they have yet to find out what happened to their dad. Madge has been holding on to the telegram, hasn't uh, brought herself to say anything, because she doesn't want the kids to associate Christmas with death. Fair enough. But the son ends up peeking into the doctor's main Christmas present a little early. Turns out it's a portal to a forest full of pine trees that grow their own Christmas ornaments. Except they're not ornaments, they're eggs. And from one egg hatches a wooden man, decked out as a king, who slowly grows to be about eight feet tall and heads to a tower, which is in fact a tree that has grown into a tower somehow. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, the boy's sister follows along with the doctor uh, to figure out where the boy went. And they find him in the tower, sitting on a throne, wearing what looks like a gold headband that uh, has put him in a trance. It seems the wooden king, along with a wooden queen, uh, need him for something, but he's too weak to do it. And when the doctor tries to take the crown off his head, uh, the doctor is proven to be too weak to do what they need. Meanwhile, the sister proves to be strong, but too young. So that's a clue. Only females can do what uh, the wooden people need. But what do they need? Meanwhile, Madge has found her way into the forest and come across three people from Andrazani. Seems they're harvesters. And the uh, material they're harvesting, the trees themselves. Turns out Andrazani trees make good fuel, but the trees have to be melted down first with acid rain. 
like highly corrosive acid rain, not the stuff that takes a while to take effect, like on Earth. So after briefly taking the uh, workers hostage by faking helplessness and then pulling a gun, which was concealed by uh, her wool coat, which mucked up the Androzani scanners, good on Madge, <laughs> She, after they vanish, a pre-programmed uh, teleport, she figures out how to get their harvester going and makes her way to the tower. And then crashes it. <clears throat> the harvester, I mean. Because she's not exactly the best driver. Earlier, uh, when the doctor fell to Earth after the spaceship blew up, um, she had to help him get to a get to his TARDIS with him being incapacitated by uh, wearing a backwards medical suit which patched him up so he found out firsthand that Madge is uh, not the best driver or at least not the best Parker but anyway she makes her way to the top of the tower and gets drawn to the crown which she then puts on turns out the wooden people needed a mom to be their mother ship because the luminous souls of the forest uh, need to escape before the uh, acid rain destroys them. They can live on as stars, but they need to get out of the forest. And with Madge's help, they do. They fly at the very top of the tower, which is a sphere ship, into the time vortex, and Madge uses her memories as a way of controlling it. Unfortunately, one of the memories is of her husband dying in that plane. But a curious thing happens. We go back to the scene where her husband gets vanished, but he sees a light. Not like the kind of light you see as you're dying, but a beacon. And... He steers his ship towards it, and somehow they all end up back at the relative's mansion, safe and sound. And <clears throat> the promise the husband made to his co-pilots that they'd be at home in time for Christmas, he gets to keep that promise, and the government gets their plane back in relatively good condition. So... With that, um, the doctor bids farewell to Madge and her family, and I looked it up. Um, by now, 2022, the daughter should be in her 90s, and the kid and the boy should be in her in his 80s. So, if uh, the people working on Doctor Who want to cameo those characters again. They would have to find some elderly people and make it happen. On to the next adventure. Um, it seems Amy and Rory have hit a bit of trouble. When the doctor finds them again, they're divorced. I mean, what the heck happened? Rory protected Amy for 2,000 years. And Amy uh, survived... Uh, isolation for 36 years by making a Rory robot. And yet here they are, divorced. And what's more, um, earlier when uh, the doctor was with Craig, he noticed Amy and Rory uh, giving autographs, because turns out Amy's a model, and she's still modeling. But unfortunately, the Daleks have plans for all three of them. The doctor gets lured back to Scaro, or should I say what's left of it, by a woman claiming to have escaped the Dalek concentration camps, only she's actually been converted into a Dalek puppet. Uh, her head has an eye stalk coming out of it, and her hand has a blaster coming out of it. So she collects the doctor and a couple of random 
puppets collect Amy and Rory. The only reason Rory was there was because <clears throat> he was finishing up the divorce proceedings. Why they're getting divorced? Who knows? For now. But eventually they wake up on a spaceship, and it's none other than the Dalek Parliament. It seems when the uh, Doctor rebooted the universe, Big Bang 2, he accidentally rebooted the Daleks as well. They may not be as powerful as they once were. There's no uh, reality bomb or no uh, planet moving, but they're certainly a threat. And while the new Dalek paradigm is there, the White Supreme is working in tandem with a Dalek Prime Minister. There's no Emperor, as far as I can tell. And the strategist is there, sort of chilling in the background. And the red drones have taken up a command position. And their army is primarily classic Time War bronze drones. So we got a little bit of everything. And yes, the uh, new Dalek Parliament looks better with their more metallic paint jobs. Just like I said. And... <clears throat> While there's no sign of the uh, scientist or the eternal, they, they don't really factor into this episode. The reason the Doctor and his companions were brought here is because the Daleks want him to save them. Yeah, it's gotten that bad. Even the Daleks are begging the Doctor for help. It seems that over the millennia, some Daleks have gone so insane that they can't be allowed to roam the galaxy, even though it would cause such delicious chaos that you would think the Daleks would revel in that, but nope. They need more ordered drones. So they built an entire asylum into a planet, and now there is a signal emanating from the planet, which means something is inside it that shouldn't be and if that someone can get in, the insane Daleks could get out. So, uh, they've decided to finally destroy the asylum. Originally, they had left the asylum intact because the insane Daleks have such hatred that the other Daleks just couldn't bring themselves to destroy something so beautiful to their uh, eye stalks which sickens the Doctor, especially when the Prime Minister says perhaps that's why they've never been able to kill him. Because of his hatred of the Daleks. That rankles him, of course. But he's willing to help, because someone is on that planet and they need saving. And if that means the Daleks get to get a victory by destroying their asylum once their shields are taken down, so be it. So, Amy and Rory get sent to the planet with nothing but special wristbands to protect them against nanodrones, which are what uh, turn humans and humanoids into Dalek puppets. Eventually, they find a guy who's trying to get into an escape pod. Turns out uh, an ocean, a space liner crashed on the planet a year ago. And he's trying to find the other pods that uh, landed. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we find out that guy was already dead. He thought he'd been only out there a couple weeks, but really it's been a year. Uh, and the reason he doesn't look dead is because the snow preserved his body. And <clears throat> turns out... You don't have to be alive to be a Dalek puppet. So his body sprouts the necessary accoutrements, and so do the desiccated corpses that they find in the escape pod once uh, Amy and Rory hook up with this guy and promptly escape him, Amy losing her wristband in the process, which means she's slowly being turned into a Dalek puppet. Uh, it slowly alters her perceptions, so she sees Daleks as regular people, 
and all her love is being replaced with hatred. Meanwhile, Rory ends up uh, getting sent into the asylum itself. See, the other two landed on the surface. Um, <clears throat> and so he gets to meet, at least hear from, one of the people responsible for the signal. A girl named Oswin Oswald. Very, very smart, good with computers, and trapped in a small area with dwindling food supplies, which she repeatedly uses to make souffles, and fails, unfortunately. And <clears throat> um, she's been able to hack into the Daleks' systems and monitor things and send out signals to try and get rescued. She's been there a year, and th things are getting desperate. So while Oswin is helping uh, Rory survive the asylum, which is full of uh, partially functioning Daleks, who all still have their guns, um, she also hears from the Doctor and Amy, uh, who comments that she's not angry, she's Scottish. And the Doctor sort of flirts with Oswin, and their back and forth is cute. Also, the back and forth between her and Rory is cute, because she mentions the first boy she ever fancied was named Rory. Actually, she was called Nina. Oswin was going through a phase. I wonder if she'll ever meet Bill. Oh, we'll get to that later. Anywho, um, eventually, uh, when Amy, Rory, and the Doctor hook back up, Rory discovers what happened to Amy, and what's slowly happening to Amy, and he surmises that because he loves her far more than the other way around, he'll have her wear his armband um, so they'll have more time to figure things out. But that ticks Amy off something fierce. Because while, yeah, she did divorce him, she did so because... It turns out, what they did to her in Demon's Run rendered her barren. She can't have any more kids. One would think uh, they could exhaust more options before divorce, but in her twisted uh, own way, she decided to let him go so he could find someone who can give him some kids. Not just a jailbird who's already an adult. <clears throat> but, it turns out, the doctor pulled a fast one. You see, they got this all out in a shouting match to sort of clear the air, and the whole time, Amy had the doctor's wristband. Turns out, he doesn't need one. The nanobots don't affect Time Lords. Eventually, the Doctor makes his way through the intensive care unit, where several Daleks that have encountered him over the years are kept. And while some of them are not armed, they do have their suckers. But before they can <clears throat> plunge the Doctor to death, the way that one guy... Uh, in the Ninth Doctor's era went, Oswin pulls a miracle. She hacked into the Daleks' shared uh, store of knowledge and deleted the Doctor from their minds. So the Daleks just go back to whatever it was they were doing. Unfortunately, when the Doctor finally gets into Oswin's inner chamber, he finds a chained-up Dalek waiting for him. 
There was an Oswin Oswald. She crash-landed on that planet a year ago. She climbed down a ladder that Team Tardis later found. And she met the Daleks. But rather than be turned into a Dalek puppet, they <clears throat> praised her ingenuity by uh, gifting her a full Dalek transformation. They turned Oswin Oswald into a Dalek. And she couldn't cope. She thought she was still human. And the doctor points out that those supplies that always seem to be just at the point of running out, but never do, they were a mental construct. And while Oswin does have a bit of a breakdown for a moment and nearly exterminates the doctor, she ultimately makes the sacrifice necessary for them to all survive. She takes down the Asylum's shields, calls the doctor a clever boy, and tells him to run and remember. Because she fought the Daleks and she remained human even unto the end. So, Team Tardis, now a little less hostile towards each other, lands back aboard the Parliament ship only to find none of the Daleks know who the Doctor is. They hear the word Doctor and think, Doctor who? Turns out, Oswin deleted the whole Dalek uh, database. So now, while the Daleks are still a potential threat, <clears throat> at the very least, they won't be hassling the Doctor for a while. And so, Amy and Rory get back together, and the Doctor goes on his merry way. <clears throat> but then, in the near future, a spaceship shows up with no one at the controls. So, the Doctor sort of kidnaps Amy and Rory, and accidentally kidnaps Rory's dad, who's awesome. Uh... To help deal with the problem. Because while the uh, near future military don't want to destroy the ship, if it gets too close, they have to lock on missiles. So the Doctor and Team Tardis, plus Papa Williams, end up aboard the, tar aboard the ship, which turns out to be a Silurian Ark many uh, various dinosaurs uh, allowed to roam around in their own personal environments and a whole bunch of Silurians in stasis although the doctor notices there are no Silurians aboard the ship there should be but there aren't and later he finds out why a jerk by the name of Solomon whose people assign a monetary value to anything and anyone has hijacked the ship. And because of certain failsafes, <clears throat> he can't pilot the ship. So instead, it autopilots back to Earth. And he also murdered the Silurian crew. And he uh, also is willing to destroy his stockpile of potential money. He mercilessly guns down a Triceratops in front of everybody. He is a cold monster. And he's also got two uh, comic relief villain robots who I wish could have survived somehow, but it's probably good that they didn't because it was their guns that killed the Triceratops. Oh well. <clears throat> Meanwhile, uh, another couple of uh, companions that uh, the doctor brought along are a big game hunter 
who might be useful at curtailing some of the uh, more aggressive dinosaurs. And Queen Nefertiti, who owes the Doctor a favor after he saved her people from something nasty. And when Solomon finds out about Nefertiti, he decides to take her, threatening to kill everybody if uh, the Doctor, who was nice enough to patch up the guy's damaged legs uh, before he found out the truth, <clears throat> um, doesn't acquiesce to Solomon's demands. So, he uh, lets Solomon take Nefertiti, and we find out why the Silurian ship can't be piloted by just one person. Turns out you need two people who are related, like siblings or father and son. So, yep. The Williams boys get to pilot a spaceship and turn it away from Earth and back to a planet that can support Saurian life. Meanwhile, the missiles that have already been locked on to the uh, Silurian ship, oops, get diverted to Solomon's ship. And <clears throat> when uh, the Doctor quickly deactivates the robots and saves Nefertiti. He bids uh, a not-so-fond farewell to Solomon and gifts him the missiles, which are very, very valuable, and locked onto his ship now. Kaboom! And so the Doctor ensures that the dinosaurs now have a place to call their own, Hopefully with no more asteroids threatening them. Uh, Nefertiti decides to not go back to ancient Egypt, but rather stay with the big game hunter. So that's why her tomb was never found. She didn't actually die in Egypt. She lived out her life with the big game hunter and was buried somewhere else. Meanwhile, Rory's dad gets to have a lunch with... A view of the planet from the TARDIS. Earth, that is. The planet Earth. So now, Mr. William Sr. can count himself among the Doctor's companions. Then, after dropping off uh, Mr. Williams, the Doctor, Amy, and Rory head to uh, Mexico for Dia de los Muertos, only to end up right outside a small town in Texas called Mercy, which is strange. It's got this line that doesn't seem crossable, even though the Dr. Amy and Rory easily cross it. <clears throat> and the doctor finds electric lights all over the town about ten years too early. And when uh, one of the townsfolk asks whether or not this doctor is an alien, when he says yes, they try to turn on him. Until the sheriff uh, sets them all straight. <clears throat> Turns out there's another alien doctor here. Um, a guy called Jax. Who has been helping the town um, in his own way after he crash-landed not too long ago and they saved him from the wreckage. It seems there's enough power on his ship to provide electric lights for the town, and he even saved them from a cholera outbreak. Although the thing about cholera is it's pretty easy to uh, avoid if you wash your hands after you go to the bathroom and you boil whatever water uh, you use. But, um, there's also a need for sugar slash salt water to keep, uh, people hydrated when they do get sick. So it's actually really simple to save a, a small town from cholera. But it's the thought that counts. Dr. Jax, um, is really quite 
a helpmate. <clears throat> Only we quickly find out that he's not a saint. He's a sinner. Turns out his planet was at war with itself. And in order to end the war, he and several other scientists, because he's actually a scientist also, <coughs> they created a legion of cyborgs. They cut into people. They put machinery into them. Not all of them survived. And the ones that did couldn't go back to their old lives. Although why you can't just replace the gun and targeting system with a prosthetic arm and a prosthetic eye and have them become uh, factory workers, I don't know. But unfortunately, one of the cyborgs, which <coughs> isn't quite dead, decided to do a vengeance tour. He's killed all the other scientists, and now Jack is uh, the only one left. But he's pre-programmed to not harm civilians if he can help it. So that's why there's a line around the town. Anyone who crosses it is in his crosshair. And their supplies are dwindling fast. He's hoping they'll turn on him, the Dr. Jax. But he is prepared to go through the town in order to get to him. Luckily, Amy, Rory, and the doctor um, are there, and they'll figure things out. Although the doctor does have a moment. When he finds a man who's very, very similar to Davros, he sends the guy over the line at gunpoint. And <clears throat> when the cyborg tries to kill him, the sheriff gets in the way. Especially heartbreaking because he's played by John Crichton actor Ben Foster. Ever the classic American. <clears throat> so, um, with his dying breath, he makes the doctor the sheriff, and um, it's up to him to figure out how to dissuade the cyborg from enacting frontier, frontier justice. Because despite what Jax has done, he still deserves a trial. And Doctor even has to stand up to one of the townsfolk who's prepared to kill him in order to protect the town. But the guy's just a kid, so... Doctor's able to talk him down, although he admits dealing with scared humans is far less preferable than dealing with even Daleks. Eventually, using a bit of trickery, the Doctor gets uh, Jax away from the town and into his spaceship. But Jax decides no more. and blows himself up and his spaceship, denying the cyborg his revenge. And while um, <clears throat> the cyborg does consider just going out into the desert and self-destructing, the doctor gives him a new idea. And up until this point, We've had a narrator, an old woman, and we find out that during these events, her great-grandma was actually a little girl who witnessed the whole thing. And we find out why the town of Mercy doesn't seem to have a police system. If you try to start a fight, you'll meet the alien cyborg gunslinger, who is now the eternal marshal. So, sort of happy ending there.
Then, um, the Doctor, after spending time away from Amy and Rory, returns when these black cubes, the size of the Lament configuration, show up all over the globe. They seem perfectly harmless, but you don't underestimate something that looks perfectly harmless. I mean, there were Mogwai, there were Tribbles, there were um, those little creatures that can't be around other pets that Spongebob bought for Gary to have a companion. <laughs> yeah, trust me, these cubes are dangerous, and the Doctor knows it. And so does Unit, who is now headed by Kate Stewart, the Brigadier's daughter. Uh, no word on whether or not her son is still canon, but she's taken Unit into a more scientific uh, direction. And they reminisce about the Brigadier for a while and talk about the cubes and decide that they need to observe them. So, the Doctor, Amy, Rory, and Rory's dad proceed to observe the cubes. Of course, this drives the Doctor insane because he doesn't like to uh, experience time one second after another in the proper order. Um, <clears throat> he tries to keep busy while Amy and Rory watch the cubes. Turns out he only wasted an hour's worth of time. So he decides to do a bit of traveling and over the long, long months, stretching out into a year, nothing happens. But no one at Rory's hospital, where he's a nurse, seems to notice A, a little girl holding one of the cubes and not reacting to any stimuli, and B, people vanishing, and these weird uh, twin nurses, or twin male nurses, who always seem to have syringes available, as if they produce them out of their hands. Eventually, the cubes start reacting, and Unit is put on high alert. Um, eventually, the cubes start counting down, but when they reach zero, <coughs> nothing happens. So, the doctor has to figure out what's going on with nothing to go on, although people are smart enough to get rid of as many cubes as possible. But eventually something happens. People start having fatal heart attacks, just dropping. Kind of like someone I don't want to get into because that's personal, but I know what a sudden death heart attack is. And that's what happens to all the people, well, most of the people around the world. Not everyone, thankfully, but some. Even the doctor loses uh, function in the left heart, which later Amy has to restore using a defibrillator, which the doctor did not enjoy. <laughs> Even though he is happy to see Lefty beating again. Turns out the cubes are relaying electrical energy. That's what caused everyone's heart to stop. So before more cubes show up and everyone on Earth gets exterminated, he's got to figure out what's been happening. And eventually he finds out there's a wormhole in Rory's hospital. Earlier, while, it, while Rory and his dad were helping people, uh, <clears throat> Rory's dad came across the two uh, male nurse twins who proceeded to kidnap him and Rory ended up following them through the wormhole which is in an elevator <clears throat> and comes out on a spaceship 
Yep. It's somewhere in deep, deep space, but it's got a connection to Earth. Through the cubes. And Rory quickly gets knocked out. <clears throat> Eventually, uh, the Doctor and Amy uh, find the wormhole in the elevator and discover who's responsible for what's been going on. A species that's legendary even to the Time Lords. They they muck about in people's business. And they've chosen humanity to be wiped out because they think we're a plague. And yeah, while we do make some mistakes, the Ood enslavement being one among many, we eventually learn from said mistakes and do better. Luckily, the Doctor is able to uh, trigger a reversal of pulse energy to not only bring people back, but it accidentally destroys the spaceship. So the humans that were stuck on the ship, sedated, are woken up, and they evacuate. <clears throat> And once again, the day is saved. Um, Rory's dad does broker the subject of whether or not it's safe to be a companion of the Doctor. And <clears throat> the Doctor does make promises to keep them safe. And <clears throat> um, he also says that, or the Rory, Rory's dad also says um, that Amy and Rory should travel with the Doctor as long as possible because they're doing good work so long as they get home safe. Oh, if only they knew. <clears throat> Later, they are having a picnic uh, just outside of New York, New York in modern times. And <clears throat> um, we find out that Amy and Rory have been traveling with the Doctor a long time. Over ten years now. And people are starting to notice that the two seem to be aging just a wee bit faster than the rest of them. Because, well, the Williamses just aren't experiencing linear time like the rest of us. Also, Amy has reading glasses now. Unfortunately, when Rory goes to get a refill of coffee, someone or something sends him back to the late 1930s, where he meets up with his daughter, River Song, who has been pardoned of her crime, killing the Doctor, because apparently the Doctor never existed. He's been following in Oswin's footsteps and erasing himself from various databases in time. So, after being pardoned, Dr. Song becomes Professor Song, and also becomes a detective and an archaeologist. Yeah, she's a hat trick. <clears throat> Unfortunately, uh, thugs capture Rory and River and take them to uh, the mansion of this rich guy who somehow, someway, has captured a weeping angel. Yes, the angels are back. And they've brought baby angels who like to pitter-patter around and giggle and appear looking like uh, stereotypical cherubs, but they're anything but. Those are what sent Rory back to the 30s. <clears throat> and earlier, uh, the rich guy paid a detective to investigate a hotel where very young and very old people seem to show up. Where the poor guy finds himself on his deathbed. Old. 
And we also find out that the Statue of, Liber of Liberty itself is a weeping angel. I wonder if the French knew that. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the Doctor and Amy try to track Rory down. Because they realize that the book that the Doctor's been reading this whole time is actually uh, written by River. And it contains spoilers of this whole adventure. But they have to be careful not to uh, read too far ahead, or else they'll fix the point in time and it can't be avoided. History's in flux as long as they don't know what's coming. <clears throat> Eventually, um, the Doctor and Amy managed to land the TARDIS in 1939 New York, um, which was rather difficult because of all the displaced time energy. It's like trying to land an airplane in a blizzard. So River, working alongside the Doctor, who uh, communicates through a Chinese vase that uh, the Doctor knew about, and River knew about. <clears throat> uh, River's beacon works, and um, they land the TARDIS in the mansion, which knocks out the rich guy. <clears throat> but not before the weeping angel, who's also been tortured and has been screaming for help from the other angels this whole time, um, manages to grab River by the wrist. It's too weak to send her back in time, but... River's got to figure out a way to free herself without busting her wrist, because the Doctor already knew she was going to break her wrist. <clears throat> and the Doctor decides to try and tempt fate with potential paradoxes. Oh, I just know they're going to end up getting attacked by time bats at some point. Meanwhile, Rory gets manhandled into the basement, where baby angels are pitter-pattering around and giggling. And they send him to the hotel, which is known as Winter Key, to meet his potential fate. <clears throat> also... Um, while River tries, she ends up failing to uh, free herself without breaking her wrist, and the Doctor, against her wishes, uses just a tiny bit of his Time Lord energy to heal her wrist, and she drops a bit of a hard truth on Amy. You don't want to let the doctor see the damage, and you don't want to let the doctor see you age. Because Amy and Rory have been contemplating um, no longer traveling with the doctor. <coughs> Even though uh, Rory's dad gave him the go-ahead to travel as long as possible. Honestly, Amy and Rory just want regular lives again. And the doctor understands. So anyway, eventually they take a car to the hotel, thanks to River's tracker, and they find Rory just in time for him to see his elderly self on his deathbed say goodbye to Amy, who he hasn't seen in a long, long time. So yeah, Rory Williams, the last centurion, the man who dies again and again has died his last. But if the Doctor can figure out a way to create a strong enough paradox, then this hotel, which has been turned into a feeding ground for the angels to repeatedly uh, drain away time energy from victims, 
will be poisoned and they'll all die. The angels, I mean. So, with the Statue of Liberty looming over him and Amy at the top of the building, Rory makes a choice. He's going to die one more time, commit suicide. Yet he's already died. That should create enough of a paradox to fix everything. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the uh, rich guy, well, he's left to the tender mercies of the angels, who I'm sure send him back to a very pleasant time. Maybe the first century BC. Just to see what happens when he has to deal with hostile natives and a language barrier and uh, no technology whatsoever. Eh, who knows? <clears throat> Meanwhile, Amy decides that where Rory goes, she goes. And so they take a tumble off the building and bam! The paradox is created. The angels are destroyed. The Statue of Liberty goes back to being a regular statue. And the TARDIS, Amy, Rory, and the Doctor end up uh, back in a cemetery outside of New York, New York, in 2012. Funny thing is, they ended up uh, in that cemetery before when the Doctor tried to send the TARDIS to 1939 New York. Um, but they bounced off a bit of time energy and basically landed there. And for good reason, because the Doctor noticed a chapter title in the book he was looking for clues in called Amelia's Last Goodbye. So something's about to happen. But all seems well. Um, the TARDIS just needs a bit of a cleanup because it got a little scuffed by time energy. Um, everybody's alive. And Rory, before he enters the TARDIS, sees a grave with his name on it. And poof, he's gone. One surviving angel that was in the cemetery set him back in time. And he lived out his life and died at age 82. The last centurion is laid to rest. And Amy is distraught. But she has a ray of hope. Hopefully, the angel will send her back to where Rory is. And Amy makes her final decision. She says goodbye to River, and despite the doctor's pleas to get back in the TARDIS, because they'll have to figure something out, she bids her raggedy doctor goodbye. And Amelia Pond Williams lives out her life with Rory and dies at the age of 87. And so, to prevent the Doctor from traveling alone for at least a little while, because they're a bad influence on each other, she can't stay with him forever, River travels with the Doctor a little bit now free from her incarceration but it doesn't last and she realizes that she has to write a book about these events so she promises the doctor before she sends the manuscript to Amy to get it published because that's where the book came from all along River promises to put in an afterword for the doctor which just so happened to be the page that the Doctor tore out of the book earlier in the show. 
and it's a heartfelt goodbye from Amy. And a request. Go tell that little girl waiting for the doctor to come back what's going to happen to her. And to be patient. And so, the story of the Williamses comes to an end. There are a couple of YouTube videos. Um, one done by... Uh, the actors who play Amy and Rory um, that they did during the COVID lockdown and <clears throat> a storyboard of a scene which I consider canon where uh, Mr. William Sr. meets his adopted grandson who's now 60 and who informs him of what happened to his son and daughter-in-law but now the doctor is going to travel alone. Unless he meets up with the impossible. But that's a story for another time. Uh, until then, this is Mr. J signing out. And remember, don't blink. But do run. And remember the companions of the past. Because they'll always be alive so long as we remember them. Cheers, folks.